Okay, so hello once more and welcome to the fifth uh, practical class on discrete math. Uh, today we'll uh, finish with this uh, polynomial uh, tasks business and we'll uh, continue with uh, the list of questions on P and NP. I will share these things uh, in the chat and also they will be uh, available in the bottom of this video in the um, description. So let me uh, open the Jamboard and uh, first maybe we'll continue with discussing uh, some of the um, problems of the previous task. Okay, I hope you see the empty Jamboard. So does anyone want to discuss any of the remaining problems from this what is called polytasks polynomial time computation okay if there are no specific uh, re requirements i would like to discuss uh, problem number five so uh, we have uh, sort of solved 5a uh, but uh, again up to uh, um, theorem that there is a criterion of existence of an Euler cycle. So you remember that an Euler cycle existed if and only if uh, the uh, graph was connected first. This is uh, necessary. And uh, the second, uh, that uh, uh, the graph uh, should have, so for a cycle, all the uh, vertices should be even and for a uh, uh, path which is less than an Euler cycle uh, and we use the following fact that a graph has an Euler cycle if and only if it is connected and it uh, all of the vertices in this graph are of even uh, degree. So as we know, both of these uh, conditions are essential. If the graph is not connected, then of course you run into problems. You cannot um, uh, find uh, any sort of cycle which traverses all the graph, not neither Euler nor Hamiltonian. But also the second is also important because if you have odd vertices, and we can see it on the Jamboard here that uh, if you have a vertex which has an odd number of say, five edges which come into this one, then if you try to traverse it with an Euler cycle, so an Euler cycle it is a cycle which has no start and no end in a sense, right? So it's uh, 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 each vertex is equal in its rights. It, it, so when you traverse a vertex using the cycle, you have to enter and leave. So say here you enter by this one, you leave by this one, and these are already used. You should use each edge exactly once, so then you come from some other vertex, some other edge, and you leave somehow. And here there's the odd number of them. Here you see this edge, which is not used. So in an Euler path, it was um, um, allowed for two vertices to have a degree an odd degree here also be even. So you can formulate this as a theorem uh, that a graph has uh, an Euler cycle if and only if uh, it is connected. And all its vertices, well, I will say just are even. This means they have even degree. Are even. Okay. So actually, we have established only the forward direction that if the Euler cycle exists, then of course these conditions should be satisfied. But what about the backwards one? This is not was not yet proved uh, because. Uh, Possibly there could be other obstacles for the graph to be um, 
uh, have an Euler cycle. We know that these are necessary conditions, but why are they sufficient? And this actually jeopardizes the solution of problem which we denoted by 5a, that an to construct an algorithm which even determines that the graph has an Euler cycle. So this algorithm would check for existence for connectedness and for degrees, but maybe the cycle is still non-existent. And also, there is a question 5b, how do we get such a cycle if the answer is yes? So again, this criterion does not give us a cycle. But fortunately, uh, this is uh, easy to uh, mitigate just by presenting an algorithm for 5b. And we'll see that this algorithm will always be successful, provided that uh, these conditions hold. That is, the graph is connected, and it, all the vertices are even. And let's find this. How do we do this? Uh, so uh, we start with so this is algorithm uh, for finding an Euler path, Euler cycle. So for paths, it's similar, and I will not uh, take time for that. Uh, so the algorithm starts working, and if the graph is good, then it will succeed. If not, it will fail, and uh, by the way, it will solve 5A also, of course. Uh, so we start with the greedy one. So a greedy algorithm is an algorithm which just tries to just do what it can do. And uh, until it's possible, it will do the job. Uh, so, what should a greedy algorithm do? Well, it starts from a vertex. Let's call it V0. It's just it's the starting vertex is arbitrary. And it starts trying to provide a cycle. So, we, well, the, if the graph is non-trivial, there are other vertices. The graph is connected, so the, the, there should be something connected to V0. So, there is some other vertex V1. And all of these edges, we are going to mark them green, they are, so we go forward, so this is V2, say V3, and the cycle could be V4 here, and this, our path could go, uh, it could return back, so it could go like this, then like this, then it could say return to V2, then from V2 it goes somewhere else to some, which we can denote by V5, the only condition we maintain is that we do not reuse edges which were already used. So if we already traversed an edge, we are not allowed to visit it once more and we do not do this. So what would happen, actually? We can claim that this algorithm will never get stuck. So once we reached a vertex, which is not V0. Um, we, even if we came, for example, to this once more, so say we, ha we came to, say, V5, then we went to some other one, and then we went backwards here. So uh, now we are in vertex, this some V6. Uh, now we're in vertex, which is denoted by V2, and we have used an odd number of edges, right? One, two, three, four, five. Why? Well, because we entered this vertex, left it, entered, left, entered, left, and finally we entered it. So we entered the vertex V2, and now we're inside. And if V2 is not V0, then we always have an edge to go forward somewhere here. Why? Well, just because uh, the degree of V2 is even. So therefore, if we entered, we can always leave. So the greedy algorithm will construct uh, a, a cycle, and uh, but it, of course it cannot work infinitely long because it is uh, the graph is finite. So what will happen finally? We we'll return to v zero, right? So. Uh, at some point, the algorithm, well, it will return to V0. Of course, V0 could be also, there could be also some paths like that here. 
So V0 could be visited several times, but here though, this is the green cycle. So will, will this be an Euler cycle, how do you think? So this cycle, it, <coughs> well, it starts from V0, ends at V0. This doesn't matter because all the vertices are actually equal here. But uh, so it's not a simple cycle. It can return to the, the vertices many times. This is okay. Uh, it's it uses each edge not more than once because all the edges which we marked as green they're really green, and uh, we visited them one time. But this could be not an Euler cycle because we couldn't would have could have not exhausted all the edges. So nowhere in this construction we guarantee that all the edges were visited. So how to cope with that? And here we need to use connectedness of the graph. So the idea is as follows. So suppose that I will write it in blue now. Suppose that somewhere here there is another edge which was not uh, used in the green cycle. But the graph is connected. So this means that such an edge exists near this cycle. It should, such an edge should be connected to the cycle. Because if there is no edge which is not green, which is connected to the cycle, then these green edges form a connected component. And the graph is connected, so they should exhaust the whole graph. So the idea is that there exists some edge like that, which is connected to the graph. And let's start a new cycle now. So we start a new cycle, let's call it, say, W1, W2. This cycle started from this V5, which we can also call W0. So from this point, we start developing a new cycle, which we'll call the blue one. So uh, the blue cycle develops from here. It's also maybe not simple, so it's somehow it evolves and it goes like that, say like that, like that comes back. Then it could say return here, then it goes somewhere here, then it goes somewhere here. It can return say here, then go here, goes here. And what will, okay, even this cycle could even come to the, to the green one, so it can say do something like that. It's also okay. But what will happen finally? Well, where it will stop? At W0, which is V5, right? So it, uh, I will not name all these vertices. Yeah, so here it's just an, an intersection, but or you could also just gi give, uh, it could re return something like this. So it could be, here could be just a vertex, or, well, it, the graph is not required to be planar, so it could be also intersections of edges, which are not vertices. But let's draw it planar just for you. So at some point, it will return to this starting point V5. And here is the blue cycle. And we can draw this in, here on the right. We can draw the picture in a more, say, a schematic way. So we, here was the vertex V0. Here was the vertex, which we call W0, which is V5. And what was the idea? So the idea was that there was a cycle which started from V0 and returned to V0 via W0. At least once it came through W0. And here there started another cycle, which is the blue one. So these cycles could intersect by vertices, but they do not intersect by uh, edges. So we did not use green edges, and this is fine because if we remove them from the graph, the, edge, the degrees will still be even. Because this was just a cycle. So it's uh, here we just separate this part. And now we can unify these two cycles into one. So we can traverse it as follows, just the yellow color. So we traverse it like this, 
like we draw it like an eight or an infinity sign. Traverse it like this. Then we go to traverse this. And then we go here. So this is called augmentation of the cycle. Extended. So now we have this augmented, well, yellow over we may do, do it a green one. Again, there are two possibilities. Either we have exhausted all the edges we have. If not, then there is another one, which we say red, which starts somewhere here or maybe here. So again, then we'll get this. Again, here we draw a cycle. And again, it could intersect by vertices, but not by edges. And we gain augment. And this augmentation procedure uh, finishes in finite number of steps just because we have finite number of edges. This is an algorithm which finds one possible Euler cycle among many. And uh, of course, there is no way to provide all of them because there could be an exponential number of them. But uh, at least one exists. And uh, Yes, and if if there if there are some problems with the graph, then the algorithm will just fail. Why? Well, because uh, if the graph is not connected, then at some point we will reach the situation where the, there is a graph which has a cycle and an oil cycle there, but this extra blue or a red edge will be just outside this connected component. We could not augment the cycle. If there is an odd vertex, then this greedy procedure will fail. We'll just come to this vertex and stop there, get stuck. So this is also checking for the criteria. And now let's think about the complexity of the algorithm. We should show that this is polynomial. Again, uh, this is done in a rough, rough manner because we do not concretize what are the ways of representing this graph or stuff like that. But uh, nevertheless, it, you could do this in the following way. So, uh, what is the invariant? At each step of this algorithm, we use one of the, one edge. So, the number of these big steps of the, say, uh, adding an edge is polynomial. It's not greater than the square of the number of vertices in the graph. And now, we should make polynomial just this, say, taking an arbitrary vertex, we could just take the first one. Say, uh, taking an arbitrary edge, which comes from the vertex forward. Also polynomial, uh, well, why? It depends on the presentation of the graph. If the graph is presented as a matrix of, uh, uh, of uh, connectedness, then you just look at the matrix and it's n times. You just see all the bits. And inside this matrix, we also maintain this coloring of the edges. So we see that this is a green. We should not take it once more. If it is the list of vertices connected to one, again, we just see on the list. So again, this is, say, not more than quadratic, actually linear. In a good representation, it could be even constant, but again, we are not hunting for a concrete polynomial or hunting for polynomiality. And finally, augmentation. Finding an edge which is connected to the subgraph, but which is not inside it. Again, we maintain the set, so finite object, a polynomial size, and we just see, you see, if we have lists of uh, edges which are connected and not yet colored, we just see all our cycle, the, the green cycle, and find, okay, there is this V5, which is connected to something which we haven't yet used, and we use it. So this is how the algorithm finds an oil cycle. For oriented graphs, this could be also possible, but then there should be another criterion that the out degree and the in degree of a vertex should be the same. Okay, so at this point, any questions, comments? Okay. Well, if not, let's return to the polynomial tasks. Does anyone want to show how six is solved? Well, if no one wants, then let's postpone it. It's an interesting problem, and it's somehow outside the main idea of the course, so you still want a week to think about that because I want to uh, move to the new uh, exercise sheet and it will go into be connected with P and NP. So let's see it here. Um, some of these problems were, yeah, if, 
yeah, we can take this. Um, some of these problems are probably known to you. And uh, let's just uh, then recall the uh, answers to them. Let's, uh, so they're not just say, not actually problems, they're more like, I don't know, questions to you. Uh, so let's look at the first one. So suppose P is not equal to NP. Um, could there exist a polynomial time algorithm for translating a conjunctive normal form to an equivalent disjunctive normal? So, okay, let's first think about the, what algorithms we know. How can we translate a CNF into a DNF? So we have a conjunctive normal form. How can we transform it into a disjunctive normal form? So by now, without any complexity considerations. Just how can we do this? Maybe it's not computable, something like that. Yeah, so one of the possible answers is given here by Nadezhda Burova that you can use the table, the truth table. So you can just uh, write down, you have a CNF, you write down the truth table, and you just extract the, what they call perfect or complete DNF from that, right? Uh, you remember how to do this, to use it. So you just take all the rows which are, uh, which come with the unit, and you just take the disjunction of them. Well, this is okay, but of course this will be not polynomial, because even the size of this table is exponential. We have two to the power of n rows. There is another way of translating uh, using distributivity laws. We didn't pay much attention to that. Let me let me just show it. So it's uh, so distributivity laws. They say that say a. Uh, what should we need here? We have the conjunction. So a conjunction b disjunction d is equivalent to A conjunction B disjunction A conjunction D, right? This is distributivity. And using this, you can translate a CNF into a DNF, right? So if you say have P1 and, oh, this is not the way it is. Oh, let me say it's P or not Q, it's in a two CNF. And say Q or not R, and R or S, something like that. This can be equivalent to represented using distributivity. You should open up all these brackets. So it's going to be the following. So it says that this P, there's all possible conjunctions, right? If you have any of this, because conjunction I know this and I know this, right? So if you take the first one, it should be P and Q or Q not Q and Q, or say, so it will be like um, P and Q and R, or not Q and Q and R, or P and not R and R, etc. So some of them, of course, these could be ruled out because they're contradictory. But nevertheless, even for two CNF, you see exponential blow up. Because from, you have, see, even if you have two clauses, from each two clauses, you can choose each literal you wish. So this means that you have, uh, that this will be bad, even for two CNF. So it's a two to the power of number of clauses. If you have three CNF, you lose three to the number of clauses. So it's again exponential blow up. So now the question remains, um, can you do this translation in polynomial time, supposing that P is not equal to NP? So 
So let's first guess the answer. No. Yeah, the answer is no, of course. <laughs> we understand that. So now how to prove it using P not equal to NP? We should go from the contrary. So we should suppose that it's possible to translate a CNF into DNF and then perform the result. Okay, yeah, so Yuri gave the answer. So, well, set, you mean CNF set, of course. So suppose you have a, an algorithm which translates uh, CNF into DNF. And this algorithm works in polynomial time, and the formula is the same. So here is phi. You translate it into, say, five tiled, and five tiled is just the same as phi. So in fact, it's equisatisfiable. So this reduction will give us a polynomial. We have a polynomial time reduction from CNF set P M. To DNF set, right? This translation gives us a reduction like that. And uh, this yields P equals NP. Because what we'll have, this is NP hard, so this means that A is reducible to that. This is, let me call it like this, A. It's arbitrary NP problem. And this means that these, by, by these reductions, you can solve them it in P. So you reduce it to CNF sat. This is Cook 11 plus Satan. Now you reduce it to DNF sat using now this hypothetical transformation. And this one is polynomial time solvable. We already did this, right? So when you want to satisfy DNF, we uh, just uh, uh, check each DNF clause. And if at least one is non-contradictory, then this one is satisfiable. And satisfying this clause means that we satisfy the whole because there's the junction. OK, so if P is not equal to, this means that if this solve, it, it, such a reduction exists, then P equals NP. Therefore, if P is not equal to NP, which is highly likely but not yet proved, this will be not the case. So let's go forward. For reducibility. Well, this is the recall of the definition of reducibility. We know this, of course. And now we have three problems. Independent set, clique, and vertex cover. And, uh, well, for clique and independent set, we have already uh, discussed that uh, in uh, the lecture today. Independent set is NP hard, NP complete. Therefore, for click, we'll find out such a reduction and we'll show that click is also NP complete. So this means, by the way, that the second that click is reducible to independent set. This is already from Cook Levin, right? Because independent set is NP hard. Therefore, click is reducible to. Yeah, so a click is reducible to, to three set by Cook Levin and Satan. And three set is reducible to in set as we've shown in today's lecture. So the second one, well, by this uh, hard way, it's, it's doable, but uh, it's, uh, of course, not the correct way you should uh, do this, really, right? And, uh, but the, mm, say, real. Uh, interesting thing is how independent set is reducible to click. This will show us that uh, uh, the uh, click problem is also in PHAR. Okay, let, let's think about that. So here we have to reduce independent set to click. So what does this mean? We have to construct a function f, which is going to map a graph g and a number k, so this pair. It would map it into some g1 and k1. And the following property should hold, that uh, 
G has an independent set of size K if and only if G1 has a clique, so a set which in which all the vertices are connected of size K1. So this should hold how to construct G1 from G and K1 from K, of course. So in G, we have an independent set and it should, should somehow transform into a click in another graph. An independent set, uh, recall, it is a set where no vertices are connected. And in a click, all the vertices should be connected pairwise. Well, it's a simple question. It's not something which you should uh, invent something non-trivial. It's not like, saying encoding to reset in a graph theoretic problem. So how can you transform, say, uh, some graph with no edges into a subgraph with all edges? Make negation of this graph. Yes, so you take the complement, what they call complement. So it yeah. is called G1, it's called G bar. So it has the same set of vertices as say G is the set, it has a set of vertices V and set of edges E. And here it's E with the bar. So a vertex UV, an edge UV is E bar, if and only if it's not in E. And now we have to also to put K1. Well, K1 will be, of course, just K. So indeed, if you have an independent set in the original graph, you uh, need to exclude loops Ah, okay, yes. So let's uh, suppose that we have just a graph, not a pseudo graph, not a multi graph. So no loops, no parallel edges. And here, of course, yes, it's not in E. And of course, uh, provided that U is uh, different from V. Thank you. No, no loops, no loops, no parallel edges. Of course. So here, if we mm, replace um, the graph with its complement, then each independent set will become a clique, right? So we had a, a, some set. So, and this is an independent set. So here, somehow connected to something else. But they're not connected to each other, right? And next, I will draw the complement edges in red. So these are no edges in the original graph. Therefore, there will be the corresponding edges in the complement graph. And by the way, there is the funny thing that this direction, this <laughs> reduction works in both directions. So if in G there is an independent set of size K, in G bar there is a click of size K, and of course vice versa. So this means that it reduces independent set to click and click to independent set. Okay? Any questions at that point? If no questions, then let's go to the second part of this task, which uh, talks about vertex cover. So what a vertex cover is, let's, uh, well, not recall, but here we really give a definition of that. So the uh, vertex cover is uh, uh, a set of vertices such that every edge is incident with this set of vertices. So let, let me give an example here. So suppose we have this, let me draw that example of a graph which we had in our slide. So here is function five here, so like this, like this, and like this. And let's find out a vertex cover. So for example, we could take, so taking this one is not economical because it's, so this one kills already this round to three. So, and if we take, say, say we can take this one, and now we have to take one of these two. So this is a vertex covering of uh, three vertices. So each edge is covered by at least one of its R. Uh, so this set is denoted by U. 
and uh, for any u v in e u in u or v in u so it covers all the edges in the graph and this is called vertex covering okay and now we need to show that vertex covering is i think it should the ap complete so we have to show that independent set is reducible to vertex cover so the independent set problem is np complete therefore the vertex cover problem is also np complete how do we perform this reduction Independent set should be reducible to vertex cover. This will establish vertex cover in P hard. Again, we should have a, let's call it G right now. And we should take a graph and K and translate it into another graph and K prime, such that the first graph has a click of size K, if and only if the second graph has a click of size K prime. And the Hint here is that it's going to be again a sort of dualization, but of course not the same as in the previous task. So how is an independent set connected to a vertex cover? So you can look at the picture, by the way, here. We see a vertex cover here, right? I see an independent set also. What vertices form the independent set? So here is a set U, and I will draw it like this. And where is the independent set here? The, the, the rest, right? So if we take, say, I will draw it in, I don't know, red. So if we take these vertices, uh, then these guys, which fall the set, which we can denote as V minus U. This is going to be independent set. And this is the general uh, statement that uh, U, let's call it lemma, uh, U is a, a vertex a covering if and only if it's complement but now the notion of complement is just set theoretical it's not a graph theoretical complement in a sense is an independent set so um you see that it's, it's in the same graph so now the dualization goes on the level of these sets but the graph keeps the same why does this hold? Well, because if it's a vertex covering, then it, it grasps all the edges. So then no edge outside it. And this means that the complement is an independent set. And dually, if you have an independent set, you take its complement, each edge should uh, co somehow connect to this complement because otherwise it will be inside the independent set, which is impossible. And uh, now, how can we use this lemma to perform our reduction? We are seeking for an independent set of size k. What k prime should we take when we are seeking for a vertex cover? So first, what about g g prime, the new graph? What is this graph? It's g itself, right? And k prime should be the number of vertices. Well, we can denote it like that. We can denote it by n also, minus k. So there exists an independent set in the original graph of size k if and only if there exists a vertex cover in the same graph of the following size. And this vertex covering is exactly the complement of our independent set. And this is the criterion. And therefore, uh, this is a reduction. So this means that this guy is also in P hard. Well, I say in P hard because we have a reduction, but also it's in P complete because vertex covering is easily an NP problem. Again, it can be guessed and uh, polynomially checked. 
So all of these problems belong to NP, and all of them are NP hard because uh, three set reduces to them. So we have dependent set, we have click, and we have vertex covering. These are easy NP hard problems connected to graphs. Well, let's go forward and see problem number three. What is uh, co-NP means that uh, it is the dual class to NP. So if we flip the answer, it will be co-NP. So for example, satisfiability is NP, tautology is co-NP. So uh, a, a, a question, uh, so a problem belongs to co-NP if uh, there is no deterministic algorithm that yields yes on any possible trajectory, not on some, but on any. Everything got flipped. And suppose NP is not equal to co-NP. Why then P is not equal to NP? So uh, suppose that, let's go again from the contrary. Suppose P equals NP. And let's show that NP equals co NP. So actually this means that since NP equals co NP should be equal to co NP, we're not P equals NP in our hypothesis. So this means that this could be written as just P equals co P, right? And this <laughs> indeed follows from just the definition of P. So what is P? We can just solve the problem polynomially, decision problem, whether something is true or false. So we start with our input, perform a polynomial time algorithm, return yes if it belongs, and no if not. How can we dualize it? Well, in natural way, we perform this polynomial deterministic algorithm, and in the end, we just flip the coin. We, we replace true with false, and false with true. And it dualizes the situation. So if the original if the input belonged to our language, so it means that the answer was yes. We shall answer no. If no, we shall answer yes. It will not work for non-deterministic algorithms, because a non-deterministic algorithm, the definition of uh, uh, acceptance is more involved. We accept our input if there exists a path which is successful. If in the end of this path we replace our answer with no, this will not falsify our result, because there could be another possible path which will yield no, in the original understanding, yes now. So therefore, NP is probably not equal to co-NP. The same as, say, enumerable sets are not the same as co-enumerable. But for decidable situation with deterministic algorithm, we just do the same and then just replace, sw swap the truth value. So we know that P equals to co-P. This statement is just generally true, and it's trivial. It does not depend on any complexity assumptions. But if P equals NP, then of course P, P equals to co NP, and then NP equals to co NP. This is how stuff is solved. Okay, now more interesting part comes. Uh, but we have discussed many of these things, so I would like more to hear from you what you have learned about that. Uh, so uh, let's start with problem number five. And let's start with 5a. By the way, here there are no uh, complexity assumptions. We do not suppose that P is not equal to NP or something like that. NP is not equal to co NP. Two CNF, let's recall, it's a CNF where each clause has at most two literals. And we want to yield all the satisfying assignments of a given two CNF. Could a pollen, of course, uh, uh, exponential time algorithm could do that. We could just try all assignments and see whether the CNF satisfies them. But could this be done uh, by a polynomial time algorithm? We know, by the way, that uh, doing this for, uh, that yielding at least one assignment is possible, right? We just perform a resolution on two CNFs, and we uh, at least we understand whether a satisfying assignment exists. But how about yielding all of them? Okay. I don't think there is. So let's comment why. Why there is no such an algorithm? Yes. 
Okay, so this is, I think, the complete solution. Let's read it. So let's put a tautological input. And uh, so, well, there is an example which we can write down here. So this is something like this is big wedge of xi or not xi. So this is just equivalent to just true, right? It's a CNF. And for i from 1 to n. Any satisfying assignment is any assignment is satisfying for this formula, right? So we have 2 to the power of n satisfying assignments. And even writing all them down will require this amount of time, right? So uh, we're not polynomial, not because our, say, p not equal and p or something like that, but just because our answer is too long to write it down in polynomial time. So this does not happen for decision problems, because for decision problems, the result is also always binary, just a bit of information. But to get this done, to, to retrieve this bit, you could, it could be hard. OK, so this is uh, the answer to 2a. And now there is an interesting point which is called 2b, of, of, sorry, 5b, 5a and 5b, which uh, talks about algorithms with polynomial delay. So uh, this, as I said, looks like, I don't know, search in a uh, search engine like Yandex or Google, where you want to retrieve, well, potentially all the satisfying assignments, all the information you are searching for. But on the other side, you uh, do not want it at, at once. You wish to get one satisfying assignment. Then you uh, suppose, then you um, say stop. Then you try to find another satisfying assignment, and so on and so forth. And you, of course, as we know, the number of satisfying assignments would be exponential. So the total runtime of the algorithm will be also exponential. But the idea is that it is polynomially delayed. So the picture here is as follows. Um, so let, let us start. So we, this is the workflow of the algorithm. So it starts here, then it takes some time, which is polynomial. At this point, it returns alpha 1, which is the first satisfying assignment. Then it thinks again for a polynomial time. And at this point, it returns alpha 2, and so on and so forth. Well, what happens in then? So the total number of the assignments, as I said, is going to be exponential. So at some point, it will return alpha n, which is the last one. And here it will also work for polynomial time and arrive at a stop. So in the end, it says, OK, no more assignments. Before that, it is allowed also to perform a polynomial number of steps. So n could be exponential. And we're not controlling it because it's the number of the real number of satisfying assignments, and uh, it's it's as it is. So, if exponential, then exponential. If polynomial, then polynomial. In particular, if there is there are no satisfying assignments, then this big n is equal to zero, and the algorithm should just think for a polynomial amount of time, and say no assignments. Okay, so it's the same as you trying to search something strange in Google and it says no, well, no results. In practice, it's polynomial because you uh, actually, when you reach this point, you actually stop, look at your assignment. Somehow you think, well, is that good or you want something more? If you want something more, you restart your process, go here and then go here. And so it's interactive. This system is interactive. It interacts with the user and its response time is polynomial. The whole process could be exponential if you wish, but it's it's responding in polynomial time, fast response. Okay, so let's look at the problem. We can we solve this with polynomial delay? Okay, so let's recall first how do we check satisfiability of two CNF in polynomial time? What algorithm do we use? Resolution method, exactly. So using resolution, we can understand whether there exists a polynomial uh, satisfying assignment. So if not, 
in polynomial time, we'll understand that it's the so first thing is done. Okay, so now uh, how do we uh, return a satisfying assignment when it exists? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I guess we can, uh, first of all, we denote uh, some literals that are um, free uh, with the uh, ones and zeros. And uh, just like when we find an, a single six fine assignment. Yes, isolated and, literals, yes. And uh, then, uh, for example, we can get, uh, we can add not not x, uh, something like this, uh, and we find uh, once it's fine assignment, then uh, um, in the second round we can uh, choose another literal that is not um, uh, free and add uh, not y, for example, and so on, and uh, I guess it will be polynomial between uh, these runs. Yes, yes, this is exactly the way we should do it. I will just make it a bit more clarified in order to uh, add some discipline to this process of finding this out. So, resolution procedure. We have a CNF. Then uh, we perform this uh, process of saturation by resolution. And what this process does, it says that we have some, we'll have this CNF and we have extra clauses which are obtained by resolution rules. So some of these are, say, we have, say, P, not Q, S, for example, and we have everything else. So these are called isolated literals. So any satisfying assignment of the original CNF is also a satisfying assignment of a saturated CNF, right? So therefore, here we have P equals 1, Q equals 0, and S equals 1, and this should hold for any satisfying assignment. So this we could just fix them. And when we output a satisfying assignment, we start with this. So these values are fixed. But suppose we have some other variables. For example, we have variable R, which is not isolated, so we don't have no have another R or not R. It means that adding R equals zero and R equals one will yield uh, satisfi satisfiable CNFs. And now we, we should somehow branch. But first, from this we do the following: we take R, say not R, so R equals zero, and all this stuff. And go forward. And now we can actually recursively proceed. That you see that this is a new CNF where we actually impose the new condition of R being. Uh, yep. So again, we will saturate it and we'll get not R and P and not Q and S and possibly maybe even some T. And etc. So this this one came from saturation. Suppose we had something like not R implies T, not R or, R or, or not T. Then if we're not R, we have T. So here again, if we all our variables are already isolated, we uh, perform. We just show this uh, assignment. It's fixed. If there is another variable which is not isolated, we again proceed forward. And so we do until we run off all our, all our variables. So this is all from starting from here, here, here. This is all time before the first assignment is given. But what is the, the length of this process? Each step of saturation, it's the two CNF, so it's polynomial, right? And the number of steps of saturation is not bigger than the number of variables because we take only variables for which uh, we don't know, but nevertheless, if we take them, we, in the saturation process, we, uh, uh, we then the, the number of these variables is not bigger than the number of all variables. So we saturate, and finally, we obtain a, an assignment. 
but then we have to return. So suppose here we uh, made a choice, say, for some other letter that say u equals zero, and here we got an assignment alpha one, which says that p should be one, q should be zero, s should be one, r should be zero, t should be one, u should be zero, and we saturated, and we know that all the variables. Now we return backwards, and now we have to try u equals one. And this will probably also give us an assignment alpha two, because if there was not no isolate literal for you, they were both are okay. Then we have exhausted that. We go backwards here, and here we have to try the second chance where r equals one, and here we'll get alpha three, alpha four, and maybe more. Because here also for t there could be a possibility. And this is the procedure, it's sort of tree-like. You can actually implement it as a stack. You put your R's on the stack and you take it backwards. So this is the way of controlling that. And each time all your back and forth tracking is done in polynomial time. But the whole tree could be exponential because some of the variables could be both values. If it is, say, trivial CNF, then you saturate you will get just an empty CNF, which is always true. Then you try P equals one or P equals zero, K okay, try Q equals zero, and you have an exponential size tree. But it is true. Of, so at no point the tree is kept in the memory in whole, so it's polynomial memory, and also it's polynomial in uh, the size of it. So polynomial in the delay, but the exponential is the whole. Okay, so great. By the way, this, I think, solved also problem number 4B, that to set, giving it a satisfying assignment can be done in polynomial time. And now let's think about 4A. So suppose, well, this would yield P equals MP, but suppose that satisfiability itself is somehow solvable in polynomial time. Could you extend this algorithm in order to yield a satisfying assignment? So the difference from two set here is that now we don't know that this is actually some say version of resolution method or something like that. So this algorithm for checking satisfiability of a formula is absolutely arbitrary. And uh, how can we use it in order to find such satisfying assignment? We can use it only as a black box. So it's Oracle, which you, you give a formula arbitrary formula, not, maybe it could be not a CNF. And it answers satisfiable or not, but it doesn't give you the assignment, it just answers the, the binary result. How can you find an assignment using this stuff? I think the people are tired in the end of the class, so let me explain this and then we'll just uh, finish the um, practice class today. So the idea is quite simple. We just have to guess this assignment, but we can guess it using the satisfiability checker. So we'll say we have variables P1, P2, say P3. So I'll have the formula A. So A is satisfiable. We check A for satisfiability. If it is not satisfiable, then we have nothing to yield, right? Now we just, Try to guess. Okay, I'll try A with P1 equals zero. And I will check this for satisfiability. So if this is satisfiable, so is it satisfiable? If yes, then I will just say that P1, I will put it to zero in my assignment. If no, I'll put it to one. Right? So, because A is satisfiable, we know that, then if we try P0, P1 equals zero, and it happens to be not satisfiable, then the satisfying assignment should be with one. So next, here, suppose this is here. So next we try A, we put P1 equals one, P2 equals zero. 
Again, we try this. If it is satisfiable, then we take zero. If not satisfiable, we take one. And then the same for the whole of it. So if we have n variables, then we have n plus one calls of that, of this oracle of black box. So if set is polynomial solvable, then we can perform this algorithm. It will also polynomial multiplied by n plus one is polynomial. And uh, you will get uh, satisfiability. Uh, your satisfiability checker will yield you your satisfying assignments. So this is how it will work. And also using this, you could make a polynomial delay algorithm. So if P equals N, what is the moral of this story? That if P equals NP, then you can solve not only decision problems, but also search problems in polynomial time. So search problems on, the, on their own, they are harder than the corresponding uh, decision problems, right? Just to find one of them. So decision problem says whether there exists, and search problems asks us how to find this. So, but if P equals NP, then the search one is reducible to, this is an example on SAT, but SAT is a general, by Kuklevin, a general NP problem, so it's, the same will happen for all of them. Okay, so we finished this uh, exercise sheet, and uh, our practical class is uh, coming up to its end. We have one minute left. So tonight I will publish on the courses web page and uh, show it in the uh, Teams chat the uh, task for homework number three. So if no questions, then thanks a lot for listening and we reconvene in one week.